skinny. It's not that I like him or I don't like him. I, I respect him. See, what you guys really realize is Sergeant Wood is a bit of an idealist. He believes in this mission down to his very bones, don't you, Sergeant? Look, these people, they have no jobs, no food, no education, no future. I just figure that, you know, I mean, we have, we have two things we can do. We can either help or we can sit back and watch the country destroy itself on CNN. Right? I don't know about you guys, but I was trained to fight. Did you want to fight, Sergeant? Well, I think I was trained to make a difference, Kurt. I'm putting you in charge of this chalk. You got a problem with that? No, sir. Make no mistake. Once you're in the Vicaro market, you're in an entirely hostile district. Don't underestimate their capabilities. Now, we'll be going through friendly neighborhoods before we hit the market. So remember the rules of engagement. No one fires and looks fired upon. So let's go get this thing done. Sir, he says this is the Introduction on a uh, Tuesday night for the mentoring program, um, but it's a good reminder for all of us, and I use myself as part of this group, that uh, we are still a nation at war, and as we are enjoying each other's company tonight uh, here at UWF, um, right now it is... Uh, almost quarter after three in the morning in Baghdad and quarter of six in the morning in Kandahar. And real time, like as I'm standing up here speaking to you all, there is some 24 or 25 year old young guy or gal that's putting a bunch of other 20 somethings behind you know, some vehicles or lead them on a foot patrol or put them in some helos to go out and do a mission um, in all the theaters. It doesn't matter which one we're talking about. And, you know, they're going to go hunt down people that need to be hunted down. And knowing the enemy that's out there, um, they know this young 25-year-old and the 20-year-olds that are with her or him know that the enemy has taken 100 pounds of explosives and buried them under a road 
or in a field where a potential target might be. And for good measure, on top of this big pile of explosives, they've strapped a, like a propane tank filled with some kind of accelerant on top of it. And they've wired in a cell phone to the, you know, to the detonating device. And then they'll just sit back from afar and they'll watch the patrol come walking through or the vehicles drive by or the helos come into land. And when they do, of course, they'll hit send on their button. And that'll be just enough of a electronic charge to trigger the igniter, which will then set off the explosion. And the explosives will blow through this propane tank, and it'll erupt like a volcano. And it will burn through whatever's on top. It's diabolical. It's absolutely pure evil. And yet these, you know, young men, and I say kids, and if I say kids, I mean it with affection, so don't know anyway, you know, take me to task on it, but you know, these young men and women, these are, these are kids from next door. I mean, they could be brothers and sisters and nieces, nephews, children, grandchildren, you name it. I mean, they're kids from Pensacola, they're kids from, you know, wherever. They're just great young men and women, not a whole lot older than most of you, maybe even the same age as some that are out doing this mission. And I just throw that out to you all as we have this little chat this evening uh, to remember that you know, everything we're able to do here, and I say here, between the Atlantic Pacific, Canada, and Mexico, you know, came at a price. And there are these great young men and women out doing it for us. Uh, certainly for our veterans that are here today, I want to say thank you for your service and giving us the freedom and really the opportunity to get together. So for any veterans, and I know we're in a big Navy town, but for all the veterans that are here, uh, on behalf of everybody, I just want to say thank you for our freedom. Um, so I retired in 2008 after 20 years and a couple of months in the Army. And um, the only job I had in my adult life, I mean, that was it. College, Army, enlistment, 20 years and three months later, I'm trying to figure out what you do next. And I thought, believe it or not, when you got out of the military, you just went home to wherever home was and got a job with whoever was hiring. And I know that sounds silly, particularly with you all that are in this fantastic mentorship program, like you could never be that stupid, but you know, Matt Everest meant at the time, that's all, I, I thought that's what it is. You just went home and you got a job and you had another 20 year career and, and kind of that was that. And so for me, you know, I got out and was uh, offered a job in Baltimore, Maryland, which is my wife's hometown. And so we picked up, I'm like, man, that was easy. Picked up, moved the whole family south to Baltimore and uh, got my daughter enrolled in school, found a house to rent only to find that the job I had been promised vaporized. You know, it all turns out that it was predicated on some grant money through Hopkins, and it, it just went away. I mean, nobody's fault, it just happened. So here I am in Baltimore with no job, and we're burning through the Iraqi savings in a hurry. I mean, trust me, I'm married to the queen of why pay wholesale when you do retail kind of stuff. So we're, <laughs> we're going through this stuff uh, in a hurry, and I'm like, man, I gotta get a job. So I uh, asked my friends, you go to your network, you ask the buddies and, and your friends that you know, and I'm sorry about that, I'll just move this a little bit, ask them for you know, help, and a friend of mine uh, forwards me an email invitation to go to a networking event, which again, I realize saying to you all here, that sounds pretty typical, but remember, I've never done this before. I've never been out in this new world, and I'm like, I guess that's where you go to get a job. You know, you pass out business cards and somebody hires you. I'm like, rock on, this will work. So I fill out everything online, and um, this happens to be down in Washington, D.C. at the British Embassy. And I'm thinking, what is the chances of a guy like me getting down to the British Embassy for some kind of hotshot you know, business networking meeting? So I fill it all out, and I show up on time, um, get through all the security, and as I'm walking into this foyer at the embassy, and as you all, if you haven't seen already, you'll see it before, what do you do? You walk right in and you see the welcoming table. 
And they always have a really attractive young guy and a young gal that's there, and they're handing out everybody's name tags. I'm like, fair enough. And so I'm standing in line for my turn, and I'm watching them all get it, and I put a lanyard around their neck, and it's got their name and their title, and whatever marquee company they work for, you know, all right there, an easy eyesight. And I get mine, and it just says Matt, and there's this big white space right here, kind of like a target on my chest. And, you know, you realize, man, I'm sunk. This ain't going to get go over very well. So, well, you know, onward and upward, uh, never quit, right, wherever we were chatting before, and walk into the ballroom, and all the little clusters of Washingtonians are there, and for those of you that may be from Washington, I apologize, but you know who you are. There's that group of, of Washington people, and we go up to the, kind of the first group, and the uh, guy turns around, I put up my hand, I'm like, hi, my name's Matt Eversman, and, you know, grabs my hand and starts to shake it, and involuntarily, he can't help himself, he just looks right down at my name tag. And I can see it, I'm like, I'm, I'm not stupid, man, I, I've been here before, I, 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 I know what you're doing. And I don't like it. And I can see like a cartoon bubble above his head with, you know, all the nerdy stuff he's saying. And while he's holding on to my hand, he inadvertently just looks up, avoids eye contact, and he looks right for the door to see who's coming in behind me. I'm like, I see her. I know the game you're up to, man. I ought to give you a forearm shiver right to the jaw. And I'd like to watch you spit your teeth out like chip, like chiclets all over the floor and blood come out of your mouth. But I realized that that's frowned upon out here, and you shouldn't settle your differences like that. So I figure I'll do the next best thing, I'm just going to leave. And I'm picking up my marbles, I'm going to go home, and you know, 15 seconds into it, I'm like, I'm done with this networking stuff. And I'm literally kind of weaseling my way out of the door, out of the ballroom, and I almost to safety, and in walks the host of this evening, this event, this gentleman named Sir Robert Fry. And Sir Robert, um, pardon me, it's like the Grand Poobah of this British consulting firm. I'd never heard of it before, but that means nothing. But he's, he's up there, and I'd seen his picture outside, and it's uncomfortable because we just made eye contact, so I have to say something to him. I'm like, hi, how do you do, Sir Robert? He goes, oh, Matt, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm clearly unemployed, but I'm about to figure it out. And uh, he said, I said, no, you know, I got out of the Army, and I'm um, looking for, you know, the new adventure. He says, well, wow, well, you know, I was in the Royal Marines or the British something or other, and I have this good veteran moment for a second. He said, well, listen, Matt, have a seat. We're going to get started. I'm like, what do you mean have a seat? And I didn't realize that I'm trying to get out that there are chairs set up and a little lectern, and Sir so Robert gets up to deliver the pitch. If you haven't been, when you go, be warned. They're going to try and sell you something. They're going to tell you how great they are, what service they provide, and the solutions they offer, and on and on and on. So here I am sitting right in the front row, and this guy, I'm not kidding, from zero to 90, launches into the ether zone just like that. And I mean, he's talking about blah, blah, blah stuff that nobody could possibly understand, certainly me. And everybody's nodding their heads, and I'm checked out about five seconds into it. I have no idea what he's speaking about, and just blah, 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 blah. And I'm, man, you know, I wish he'd shut up. I'd really like to just go home. And he's talking, he's talking, he's talking. And somewhere as he's saying this, whatever it is he's talking about, he says something, 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 strategic shock, something, something. And I swear, you know, dutiful young soldier, I pull out a note cord from my pocket and a pen, and I'm like, I gotta write this down and pay attention. Um, swears I'm standing here, you write this down, strategic shock, what is that? Well, if you've heard this before, folks, I'm sorry you're gonna hear it again. If you haven't, particularly mentees in this room, it really left a mark on me in the young professional life because this idea of strategic shock you know, it's this state that you're in after you go through a catastrophic event. And a catastrophic event, not necessarily just a really bad bump in the road. Like, this is after something really bad. The worst of the worst things happen. It comes out of left field, hits you right in the solar plexus, sucks out all the oxygen, and it leaves you, whether it's the individual or the company or whatever unit of measure we're talking about, it leaves you right on the precipice of fight or flight. I mean, it's that bad. It's the worst of the worst. Trust me, it's, it's so bad you didn't see it coming and bam, there you are. You can't get your, your staff together to do an analysis, a course of action analysis, and you can't, 
you know, sit around and play the blame game and pin the tail of responsibility on somebody. You, leader, have to take action. Somebody's got to do something. And I say that specifically, you've got to get somebody to do something. And as he's talking about this, I'm thinking, this is eerie. This sounds an awful lot like an experience on the battlefield, whether it's in Mogadishu or in Iraq, and certainly I'm going to suspect in Afghanistan. And he goes on to talk about the event that's going to put you into strategic shock. He says there's three characteristics of it. It's unpredictable, it's indiscriminate, and it's ubiquitous. I don't know what ubiquitous meant at the time, but you figure it out. I mean, it comes out of the blue and bam, there you are. He talked about, and this is the 2008, he talked about 9-11. He talked about the tsunami that had just hit Asia that was just horrific. He talked about subprime credit default swaps, whatever they were at the time. But, you know, there it is. And, of course, he finishes up as he's telling this story. He's talking about, listen, something bad is brewing. You know, it's just over the bow, over the horizon, whatever analogy we use. Uh, it's not a question of if, it's when. I mean, no one's immune to it. It's going to happen. Are you ready? And, you know, all the D.C. sycophants are all nodding their head. And I'm like, man, I'm, you know, I don't even have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so he finished it up. He says, well, listen, um, let me take your questions. And, uh, of course, there he is. And predictably, there's just awkward, embarrassing silence. And nobody says a peep. As I'm watching this, I'm getting my first time in. I'm like, my gosh, you know, you've been drinking this guy's booze and you've been eating his food all night. You can't even <laughs> launch a softball to him. So I raise my hand and he says, First Sergeant, uh, so I stand up. I say, Sir Robert, trying to sound very business like, Sir Robert, if we're going to mitigate the risk or something like that of, you know, the next strategic shock that we're going to face. Where do we invest our resources? Where do we put our time and our money? How are we going to fix this thing? And he sort of chuckles a little bit. He's a little guy. He's kind of hiding behind the podium and says, well, what do you think? And of course, I'm standing in front of all these people that I don't like anyway. And the only thing that comes to mind is people. People get us through the crisis. You know, somebody's got to get somebody to do something. You know, Murphy rides along with us every day, all those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to get somebody to do something. Now, just a quick TV timeout before we, we jump into this for a second. Um, if there were two things I'd ask you to consider as you hear this story, and again, I'm kind of looking more at you all mentees, um, thinking about this idea of strategic shock. Two things I would ask you to consider, first of all, is would you go with this idea of investing in your people, or is it in process? And then the second thing that I would ask you, um, you know, sort of consider is, given where you are, are you ready for whatever comes next, this next strategic shocking event? So ponder that for a few minutes while we, we I tell you a, a quick war story. Um, and I'm not sure there's a right answer to that, but it's something to consider. Some of you all, mentors maybe, more than mentees, uh, remember when you turned on the news in around 1992, there was Christiane Amanpour standing on the beaches of Somalia in her Abercrombie and Fitch safari garb, looking bueno, <laughs> showing the whole world sub-Saharan Africa. And as a guy who had never been on a plane pretty much until I got into the Army, I had never seen such a thing. And I mean it sincerely. It was unbelievable. Starving Somali women, children, grandparents, grandfathers, little infants. Uh, horrible. I mean, horrible. Gut-wrenching kind of pictures for Westerners, particularly those who never traveled, let alone overseas. It's almost hard to imagine digesting what we're seeing. Um, Somalia at the time is called a failed state. U.S. Department of State says that, which means there's no functioning government, there's no infrastructure, no essential services <laughs> provided. I mean, there is nothing. Uh, Bowden said it pretty well. He's like, it, it sort of looked like a Mad Max movie, you know, post-apocalyptic. 
A um, little bit of a fib, the functioning government really is the oldest tribal clan system, which really at the time equates to warlords and terrorists. And basically, if you can picture this, everybody in this city block is loyal to one of these warlords, and everybody over here is loyal to another, and everything's fine unless you cross the street, and if you do, you get into a gunfight. And if you're not quickest on the draw, well, you know what, it's curtains. Um, the famine is so bad, if you wake up in Mogadishu and you're still breathing, you can pretty much just put it in the wind column and pencil, because it's good chance that the rest of the day is going to get bad. Um, that's what we're seeing on the news every night. Uh, President Bush, 41, is the commander-in-chief, and his NGOs are briefing him um, on the conservative side maybe 200,000 people on the liberal, more generous side, if you will, up to 500,000 people will die in Somalia in 1992, and maybe double that number in 93, unless somebody does something. I mean, to paraphrase. And so, in a nutshell, in a quick time out, just for reference, we can't really, don't write a thesis on the story I'm about to tell you about the UN involvement, but understand in a, in a really, for the sake of time, President Bush decides to commit forces on a humanitarian aid mission to Somalia. And in that, he sends a career African diplomat, a guy named Ambassador Robert Oakley, over to Mogadishu to meet with all the warlords face to face, and he sends the 1st Marine Division with him. And so, basically, Oakley meets with all of these warlords and has the we're not here to build a nation, we're just here to take care of your people, let us pass through, or I got 26,000 guns that have something to say about it, and everybody nods their heads, and pretty soon we're seeing the good pictures of soldiers doing humanitarian work. And it's probably not perfect, but we're seeing, you know, the food get distributed, we're seeing, you know, kids get their teeth brushed, or the humanitarian things, and everything's going okay. Now that's a lot better than it was, but it's not perfect, but it's going okay. November 1992 is presidential election. Bill Clinton wins, and in January, in walks the new commander-in-chief. It happens every four and eight years. You know, new guy comes in, inherits all the problems of the old guy. Good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what happens. And President Clinton makes a couple of key decisions. First of all, and again, essence of time here, pulls Oakley home, draws down the force, pulls the Marines home, we have a very small footprint of American soldiers in part here, and instead of having an American leading the charge, we now pull that guy back and there's a convoluted way now, instead of answering to the President, we answer to the UN, and it's starting to smell like bad stew before we get started. In the meantime, again, Picture for a second, I don't know how big Pensacola is, but assume at the time, I think there were like 25 or 26 different countries in the UN force. And for the sake of the argument here, imagine dividing Pensacola into 26 different districts and having each one of these countries running and being in charge of the security there. I mean, that's kind of how it's working. And so on this particular moment, on this particular day, Pakistani soldiers are out on a mission in their neighborhood, in their sector, and Adid's thugs are there. And they see the Pakistanis walking through the, walking through the streets. They call Adid and say, hey, what should we do? And Adid, of course, says no. And so right in the middle of the day, these 25 or 26 <laughs> Pakistani peacekeepers are killed right in the middle of the street, right where they stand, proven that other UN forces saw it happening and did nothing. You can imagine how bad that was. You can imagine that it took the Pakistani ambassador a nanosecond to call up to the United Nations headquarters, to the Secretary General, who, by the way, was Egyptian, didn't like Adid, so we've got that factor going on. It passes down to the Security Council, and it takes about another nanosecond for all the members of the Security Council to say, we want nothing to do with this joint. Nothing. Zero. Nobody. Except for the United States. You know, when Madeleine Albright said, yes, you know, we'll do it, that's where kind of the story really begins, at least for me. 
Now, this is the birth of Task Force Ranger. We put together this team of special operations forces from the United States military, all combined under one small command with this mission. Go to Mogadishu, Somalia, capture Mohammed Adin. Go get one guy in his own backyard in a city of two million people. I'm 26 years old at the time. I'm like, this is a marvelous idea. What could possibly go wrong? And I say that, I know that not to be so like, uh, funny and witty as much as, well, as we were talking at dinner tonight. You know, I joined the Army in 1987, out of the Cold War. And uh, for me, I joined the military because I wanted to go to battle. And again, 20-something years later, it's easy to sound very cavalier and just beat my chest. But at the time, I was a guy looking for an adventure. And I wanted to go to the show. And it was very easy to get behind this idea of good versus evil. You know, holding the, the Russians back in the Fulda Gap in Germany and, you know, all this Cold War stuff. I'm like, I bought right into it. And of course, I realize now a lot of it briefs a lot better when you've not been shot at. But at the time, I'm like, this is a good thing to do. So I enlisted in the Army and uh, wound up really not knowing a whole lot about anything other than I wanted to go to war. And I wound up at Fort Drum, New York, in the 10th Mountain Division. So some of you all might have heard of this, the 10th Mountain Division, very storied Army unit. Bob Dole was a member. It had, uh, did a lot of wonderful things throughout its history, and they had just brought it back to be this new light infantry unit. Like, this is a high-speed commando unit. I'm like, fired up. This is awesome. And so I go to ranger school and sniper school and do all this great training. And I realize, say, the first Gulf War, we don't send the 10th Mountain Division. And then we go to Panama, and we don't send the 10th Mountain Division. And, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I'm over two here. Um, this isn't working out well. And I'm, my enlistment's coming up. Truly, I, I guess, you know, how am I going to get through this unrequited urge to go to war? And, you know, a lot of late night discussions, I realized, you know what, if I join the Army Rangers, the chances are pretty good that I'll get deployed in the next couple of years. So I re-enlisted, believe it or not, I swear as I stand here, I re-enlisted. Wind up down for the grace of God, get through all the hoops and hurdles, and get to the 3rd Ranger Battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. And I realized the day I signed into the 3rd Ranger Battalion headquarters that this was a whole different kettle of fish than I could possibly have imagined. In a good way, but way different. You know, the big army at the time, I think we had about 480, 490,000 people, um, you know, had pretty high standards. I mean, certainly compared to, like, the fraternity house, the Sigma Chi fraternity house at Hampton Sydney College, I mean, it was a lot better than that. But I also found that, you know, once you kind of got up, got your head above water, and, and started chugging along, as long as you, you really were moving forward, you, you could do it without a whole lot of difficulty. And that's by no means any kind of backhanded compliment to the military. It's just, it's a great big organization. And, you know, to keep standards at that level is a challenge realizing, okay, you know, here in this Ranger Regiment, all of a sudden, they've got a standard that's published, and it's right up here, and they're making no joke about it. Like, this is held, you know, everybody's going to be held to this standard. The regimental commander, the highest, most senior officer, down to the newest private. So every one of my leaders and every one of my followers is going to be held to this great standard, and all these team leaders, my peers, on my left or right, they're going to be constantly nipping at my heels to, you know, certainly meet the standard, but generally to exceed the standard. And I know that sounds like I'm turning this into a Ranger infomercial. I don't mean it to be. But what I saw was, hey, you know, there's something to this standards thing. You know, and holding people accountable, you know, from your left and your right top bottom, it's like this self-licking ice cream cone of accountability and responsibility. And oh, by the way, we're going to take your job and make it relatively simple. You know, broadly, you got to be prepared to go anywhere in the world in 18 hours and win. That's it. You got about 10 tasks you got to do. You got to do them really, really well, but that's it. Do those 10 things really, really well. Be able to go anywhere in the world in 18 hours, you'll be golden. All right, this is awesome. And so we train and we train and we train. And, you know, now my, my it's just exciting. I mean, it really is. It's awesome. We're doing all this stuff. One day we're at Fort Bliss, Texas. We get the word there's a real world mission. Bravo Company, 3rd Ranger Battalion, you're going to go to the show. And everybody is excited. I mean, cartwheels and cheetah flips kind of thing. And we wind up all going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 
um, where we start to plan this mission. And it is like going to Disney for a young ranger with Delta Force and SEALs and the Air Force Pararescue and everything. It's like this is just incredible. And you're excited about doing all this stuff and you're rehearsing the plan and man, you know, we're with the Delta guys and all this stuff is all coming out. I'm like, we're going to go to the show. And somewhere in the middle of all this, we decide that we've got to do some administrative paperwork. And somewhere in there, we fill out our powers of attorney and our wills and, you know, write a letter home and, you know, get everybody to witness it and stuff it all in an envelope. And then, lo and behold, we're basically just going to wait until the president calls and then we're going to deploy which, as you can imagine, is quite a troublesome thought for most of us, because after a while, I'm realizing, you know, yesterday it was really exciting, you know, going to war. And today, I realized, man, there's something really unknown. I don't remember it being, like, super scary, but I remember it being, like, this is a really peculiar feeling that I've had that I really can't put my, my fingers on exactly, but it's probably a little bit of fear, to be honest. And, you know, excitement too. All this stuff is going on. And I remember one night in particular, walking around the compound late in the evening, and um, there was a picture window that looked out into a memorial courtyard. And the memorial, I, I mean, I saw it once. But I remember it was just this beautiful white marble wall, the flags posted and the lights are shining on it and I mean it's really a, a beautiful sight and you know I'm just sort of taking it all in looking for names that I recognized and in the middle of the scripture excuse me in the middle of the wall there's a verse of scripture chiseled in it and if you go around the military you'll see this a lot uh, not to turn tonight into a theological discussion but this scripture is from the book of Isaiah Chapter 6, verse 8. And the scripture says, And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here, my Lord, send me. I, you know, probably should be able to quote more scripture, but I couldn't. I remember that one from the day I saw it. And I remember thinking, as a, standing here today, that scripture, the greatest definition of selfless service I've ever read. You know, who will go for us? Here am I, send me. You know, definitely scared, definitely uneasy, definitely concerned all about the future, but realizing, you know, this isn't about you and your, you know, I'm going to be a tough guy ranger. This is about putting the needs of others first. You know, your ranger body on your left and your right and your team and the squad and the company and the country and all of that always comes first. And you, you know, it ain't about you. And I just, it was one of those moments that you just, I can remember like yesterday, and I realized, you know what? We're doing this mission that is noble, it's right, it needs to be done. Nobody in the world wants to do it, literally. And maybe with a little bit of ego on my part, I'm thinking nobody in the world could do it except for us. You know, that's how we roll. And here's how we're going to do it. We'll get this guy in a hard site in the house, or we'll get him in the convoy. And generally speaking, what's going to happen is when we find them, the Delta guys are going to fly in and land on the roof and at the front door and they'll blow a hole in the ceiling and kick down the front door and clear from the top down to bottom up and they'll roll up all the bad guys in there. And then the Rangers and some of the other uh, blocking position will all surround the house or surround the block so the enemy can't run in or can't run out. And then we'll have some Rangers and some SEALs and some more Air Force uh, combat controllers um, they're going to drive through the city because you've got to have a backup, kind of the ground force. And all of this will be seen by our own aviators. We've got our own helicopters, that, uh, night stalkers from Task Force 160. They're going to fly us in, drop us off, and then just circle overhead and protect us with their, their guns. Like, that's the package. I'm like, this is awesome. Get over to Mogadishu and realize not quite as simple to capture one bad guy right off the bat, so we go to plan B, got to have plan B, right? So we start to knock out his infrastructure. You know, we go after his logisticians, we go after his finance guy, you roll up some of his knucklehead mid-level managers. I mean, that stuff happens. It's not impossible, it's really difficult, but it absolutely can happen. And you know, we've proven that you can catch one guy 
anywhere in the world if you want to. I mean, look at OBL on the base of space, ace of spades. I mean, it can be done. So we're working on it. You know, we launched a lot of times on a whim, but I think there were six missions that we did actually on the ground. But most importantly, we got into first firefight. And I say that again without sounding hopefully too cavalier about it. But what we got to see was what soldiers want to know on the battlefield. How do they react in this crucible? And of course, ladies, as I say this today, it was an all-male force then, but clearly all of this would apply today overseas. And what we saw was good men, very well-trained, well-disciplined, well-loved, held to a really high standard, could do their job when it counted right off the bat. Might not be perfect, and movies make things look perfect, but it wasn't, but we got to see people could do it. See what happens when you get shot at. And that was, a, my opinion, a pretty psychological you know, edge for us. We knew we could do it, but we had to go to the show. And so now I realize, man, it's just a question of it, you know, when. We're going to get them soon. Um, sometime in the end of September, my boss, Sergeant Chris Hardy, gets called home on a Red Cross emergency. You know, in the movie, they make this, you know, life happens kind of thing. The movie, a little clip, there's this sort of Hollywood coronation of Sergeant Eversman, you know, being put in charge. But the reality is, hey, Sergeant Hardy's gotten called home in a Red Cross message. You're in charge. Don't mess this up. And I'm like, Roger that. I mean, it's sort of the succession plan built in the military. I mean, I'm the 2IC of our helicopter. Now I'm going to be in charge. Of the, I'm the chalk leader. And I remember sitting on this moment on my bunk, going through all the checklist, sensitive item stuff that platoon sergeants got to do. And as I'm sitting there, it's dawning on me that, you know, yesterday when Sergeant Hardy was in charge, you know, I'm just there to help him. Like, that's my, I'm, I'm his helper. Uh, you know, trying to exercise eyes and ears. That's what I do. Um, his call, I'm just there to be, you know, make it all work. That's it. And I don't want to sound like a lemming, but, you know, that's what the deputy does. That's what the second in command does. You just help the boss. And now that I'm in charge, I realize that, you know, it's my call. You know, everything that happens once we're on the ground that I have to deal with is my call. And if I tend to rangers, you know, through those doors, you know, in the back of the room, and it's the right call, and it's tactically sound, and everybody here would say yes, going through those doors, as soon as they breach that, you know, there's a father and a mother and a sister and a brother and you know, maybe wife, maybe kids that are going to miss birthdays and <coughs> football games and dance recitals. I mean, you name it. You see the families that have been affected by a decision that I made at 27 now. You know, it's staggering. Staggering. And, you know, I didn't feel like, hey, I should go talk to the commander or the first sergeant about this. No, you just sort of stuff that inside and suck it up. And I remember thinking to myself, trying to talk off the ledge, and I realized, you know, I've seen everybody in our chalk in battle. I've seen them all. I, I know what they can do. And absolutely, there's no doubt what all these men can do in, in, in the crucible. And all i got to make sure of, kind of leadership 101, make sure they all understand empirically their job on this mission. You know, even if you got to write it in crayon and staple it in their forehead, you know, make sure they understand that. And then all I have to do as the leader is be a problem solver. I don't say it like all I have to do, but, you know, that's it. You know, because Murphy will be there. We've seen it on every mission. Something's gone wrong. Just got to be ready to figure it out. Like, that's my idea of getting through the next mission. And sure enough, a couple of days later, on Sunday, October 3rd, we get the call that uh, two of Adid's top guys, maybe even Adid himself, are going to be meeting in this bad part of town. Um, Sergeant Eversman, you guys are going to be on the northwest corner of the objective. There's a three-story building there, so you're going to fast rope in. It's about 40 feet. Roger that. Okay. You know, I mean, not optimal, but, you know, that's just a consideration you got to do. So brief all the boys, and we make this plan really quick. We'll show them on the map where we're going to be. Everybody packs up their stuff. We move out, kind of like you saw in the movie. The bad guy goes out. The spy shows us where it is. And everybody says, get it on, let's go launch. So we all run after the helicopters. 19 helicopters are in this task force. Um, we're in the last one, my, my jog and me. 
my first time now being in charge in combat. I get into the seat behind the two door gunners, put on the headset so I can talk to the pilots. Everybody files in and everybody's looking at the door gunners for guidance and literally off we go. I mean, three minute flight. You just want to fly up to a high altitude, hit the gas, scream down the coastline so the bad guys can't hit you if they start shooting and, um, you know, then make the bank down over the desert. And I remember kind of like you saw in the movie going down that coastline. I just remember the water was so beautiful. You know, the water, once you got out of the city and out of all the built-up stuff, it was like this beautiful, almost like Caribbean water. And, you know, we're flying down there, and of course you're thinking of all the stuff you got to do for the mission. We make this bank out to the south, and um, all of a sudden they're like, one minute. You know, one minute we're going to go from altitude all the way down to about 40 feet, you know, in 59 seconds. And, you know, the helicopters do like this little porpoise jump, and there's negative gravity for a second. It feels like you're coming up the seat, but you're not. And then they just scream it down towards the target. I mean, you feel like you're, you're vertical, but you know, your heart's beating against your body armor. And you know, you're trying to, as a leader, at least for me, I'm trying to think of all the things I gotta do on the ground when I get there, you know, call the boss and head counts and all these things. And again, I'm looking at the boys who are looking at the door gunner, and you see every emotion on everybody. I mean, truly, you excitement and fear and anger and smiles. I mean, you see it all. And you're kind of just going through the motions, you know, think about all the things you got to do. And then they give you 30 seconds. You know, in 30 seconds, it's just spatial reasoning starts to constrict. You know, you just start seeing things frame by frame. When I say you, I mean me. And it's like, I can't really focus on everybody. I'm just thinking, what are the big muscle pieces that I've got to do to get out of the helicopter, grab the rope, and get on the ground. And as I'm going through all this, it's not like you look at your watch for 30 seconds, you kind of know what it feels like, and as I'm going through all this, all of a sudden the helicopter kind of abruptly comes up on its tail, comes to a hover, and the pilot says, I can't see anything. I'm like, well, that's horrible, you don't want to hear that going in on the short final, but you know, <laughs> what do you mean you can't hear anything? And I'm looking around, and the helicopter is completely enveloped in sand, like a sandstorm. That's the best I can describe it, like red Georgia clay. Everything that preceded us under the target, you know, had so many, uh, so much power from the rotors of all the helicopters, just blew everything skyward, and, you know, visual pilot can't see. And so we're sitting there, and, you know, there's a lot of fumbling around, and we're all nervous because, you know, Black Hawk helicopter is huge, 60 feet or so from nose to tail, and bad guy's got a rocket-propelled grenade threat. You're like, I mean, we got to get on the ground. And so we're monkeying around. Finally, the ropes get thrown. The boys start going out, and the pilots tell me on the headset, Matt, when you get on the ground, go three blocks in the direction of flight, and you'll be in the right spot. Roger that. You know, that works. And so, you know, every time I take off my headset, go to put on my goggles, because you got to have eye protection when you're fighting in the city. And as I put on these, eye these goggles of mine, the elastic strap that holds them breaks. Dry rods, right there. What an idiot. My fault. I mean, nobody blame but me. Clean those lenses, but, you know, it's like a billion degrees there, and sand and sweat will do it. So it's it, it, worthless. I have no eye pro. But you can't stop. There's no one else to ask, so, you know, put on my gloves. and Or, excuse me, before I put on the gloves, I put on my helmet. Right when I'm buckling my chin strap, the helicopter keels over just a couple of degrees. It's just enough i got to put my hand down to keep from losing balance. Don't think anything of it. Helicopters are like that. Put on my gloves, waddle over, grab the rope, start to slide down. I'm looking down, looking up, looking down. I'm like, hey, no problem. I mean, going in the wrong spot, it, it's happened before. It's not the worst thing that can happen. It's battle. Like, Man, I can't even see the ground. And finally, I break through the cloud, and I'm looking down, and there's one of my rangers lying on the ground. I'm thinking, my gosh, we're already in a gunfight. And I'm on the rope. I'm the leader, and I'm not there. I get down to the bottom of the ground. A couple of guys are working on this young ranger, and I mean, he's bleeding all over the place. I'm thinking, surely he's, he's passed. And the question, of course, you ask is, where did he get shot? And the answer is, he didn't get shot, he fell. I'm like, what do you mean he fell? Like, I can't even process that. Like, he fell. And sure, this kid had grabbed the rope. Just as the helicopter went like that, he lost control. You know, 60 feet. And he's still alive. Still alive. And just like in training, just a billion times you do it in training without even thinking, you turn to your radio operator 
and you say, call in a medevac, call a commander, tell him we need a medevac. And my radio operator says, I got no comms. My radio doesn't work. I can't transmit, I can only receive. So what do I do? I've got a little walkie-talkie. I pull that thing up and start yelling into it. And interestingly enough, there is a voice on the other end of this walkie-talkie. And that voice, in all the chaos, who tells me to calm down, rightly so, this voice on the other end of the radio is standing right there. Larry Perino. Ladies and gentlemen, a great hero at the Battle of Mogadishu. <laughs> He's a great man. And for all of you that are here in Pensacola, I hope you'll introduce yourself to Larry, who has just had a marvelous career and doing great things for God and country, too. But uh, Larry was there, and Larry was the one on the other end of the, the radio. And so we're trying to talk on a walkie-talkie and figure this out. And of course you can't because the connection's bad. I mean, it's gremlins in the sky. Who knows? So here I am, you know, getting the word, listen, you know, they've got to go down to the target site and Put this kid on the objective. Get him to the senior medic. They can't come to you, you go to them. Probably the best part of this movie, if you ask me. Sergeant Joyce, come here. You know, one of my two team leaders, young sergeant, 23 years old, from Plano, Texas, comes running over in the middle of the gunfight. Because right now, I mean, the first 20 seconds, here we are, wrong space, wrong place, litter urgent casualty, no comms, and we're already in a firefight from the north to south. There's the north, the west, and the east, all at once. Like, just like that. Young leader, like, can't even begin to comprehend this. But through all of this stuff, Sergeant Joyce comes running over. What do you need, Sergeant? You're in charge of the Aiden Litter team. Take Blackburn down to the senior medic, let him know what's going on, and we'll go from there. Roger that. <clears throat> you know, they put this kid on a litter. Four or five of these rangers take off in a cartoonish, like, gunfight. You know, fighting along the way, turn the corner, let me get back to fighting the fight. Trying to, anyway, as a leader, and watch him go. I mean, you like to think, though, in the, the modern sense of leadership that, you know, follow me kind of stuff. I, I ordered Sergeant Joyce to do that. That's totally unfair. I mean, that's not how it works. I mean, you could order him, but it's not going to work. I mean, I, Sergeant Joyce did that because, well, I'd like to think confidence in me, but most importantly, I, I, I've always thought, you know, selfless service. You know, his belief in the mission and his responsibility and accountability for the job he had. And off they go, doing this thing, let me fight the fight. And, you know, it seems like in no time, I turn around in the middle, again, we're, we're, we're sitting here behind this old Somali Opal or Gremlin or some ugly car. And Somalis are all shooting and we're hoping the engine block's going to hold the bullets out. And as I'm sitting there, just kind of be really small till they're done. I turn around, and there's Sergeant Joyce standing right behind me, kind of hovering over my shoulder. And, you know, I look at him like, what's up? He's like, hey, he's good. He's going to live. They're going to medevac him. Um, they caught the two bad guys and 19 others. And, you know, the commander's going to let us know when to, when to come down to the target building. And off we go. And with that, Sergeant Joyce runs right back over, joins his squad, and, you know, picks up the fight. You know, Clearly not enough time to tell an 18-hour gunfight, you know, in an hour here tonight. But I pause there for a second, and, and I would sort of throw at you, you might be asking, you know, so what? Like, why do you tell us a war story to business school students and young undergraduates here at UWF? And all like, you know, so what? I got it. It's a war story. And I, fair enough question. And I've thought about this over the years, and I've thought about it all the way through my time in Iraq, and and 10 years ever since, and I'm like, you know, for me, and I wouldn't speak for anyone else, but for me, this whole notion of strategic shock um, really is this sort of puzzling. You know, and this idea that bad things are gonna happen through nobody's fault. Things that happen politically or way up in the stratosphere are gonna ultimately, you know, have an effect on you right here, right now, just happens to be the way life is. You know, the way the doggone cards are thrown, the dice fall, whatever it is, that's where it is, and you've got to be able to get through it. You know, for me, what I realized after all of it was, first of all, you know, war is an ugly thing. Movies make it kind of glamorous. It's really not uh, necessary sometimes, but it's, it's horrible when you see the reality sometimes. 
But you also realize that we need universally very stout, tough, young men and women to be comfortable in very uncomfortable situations. And it sounds cliche, I know, but we, we really do. You know, we need kids from next door that are willing to go out and put it on the line for us. And that same mentality exists out here just in, you know, business, the same thing today. Now, clearly, the drama of battle and the drama of business are two different ends of the spectrum, but out here in this battlefield, so to speak, you got to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. You know, and I think that sort of falls into a couple of key principles that all of us got to remember. First of all, you know, you got to be well-trained, well-loved, well-disciplined, and held to a really high standard if you're going to succeed. And not just succeed, but when you're going to exceed the standard, you know, and lead the way, not to be cliche from the ranger point of view. And the second thing I've thought about is that, you know, there's something really, really incredible about that particular group of soldiers that I went to Mogadishu with. And this is not, again, the backhand compliment to anybody else in the military, but what I saw in that group, and again, from sort of the weakest link perspective of looking at all those men of all ranks, all sizes, all shapes, all colors, what I saw there are a couple of common things that they really personify. And the first thing I believe is this idea of selfless service. You know, putting the needs of others first, not only as individuals, but collectively as a unit. And it sounds, again, really Dr. Phillish, I know, but the fact of the matter is 18, 19, 28, 38-year-olds really believe that. It's in their DNA. As individuals, they do it, and then as a unit, collectively, they do it. Well, that puts the needs of others first. And I'm just done talking about client-facing, put the needs of others. Of course, you all learn that. You know you got to do it, but this is going that extra step. Always saying, what can I do to help you? How can I make you successful? What do you need from me, regardless of rank? And the second thing is, you've got to be courageous. And as that rolls off my tongue, you're like, what a fraud. Because, of course, you stand up and self-righteously pontificate about being courageous and doing your job where you're scared. It's almost impossible for any of us at any moment of any day to do it empirically. But... This idea of trying to always put that next foot forward when you're scared. You know, that's a hard thing to do. Easier said than done. You know, physical courage, people do it. Psychological, you know, the emotional courage is really hard when you're stuck in a cold, dark corner by yourself. You know, that's difficult if you haven't been conditioned. Which means somebody's got to tell you it's all right to be scared. You know, keep going forward. You know, we'll all be scared together. You know, it's that one man against the lion will only probably not even move, but two men against the line will take a step, and three scared men, more and more, pretty more, you got ten, men, ten scared men against the line, and they'll win. And then you got to be dutiful. You know, not just the legal definition of, you know, i got to follow the law like this. They're talking about you've got to fulfill your obligation. You know, never leave a fallen comrade. That's kind of what comes to mind in this story from the ranger perspective, you know, they're always faithful. We always, you know, we, we always are doing that. We won't let you fail, or if we fail, we'll fail together. I'll be there for you. I won't feed you to the lines. I won't sell you down the river. Whatever, again, cliche you're going to use, we always do what we say we're going to do. I mean, truly, the good handshake stuff. That's it. Look you in the eye, and uh, we'll all do it together. You know, easier said than done, folks, and young men and women that are going to rise up and do phenomenal things, you know, you probably got your best answers and you'll figure it out on your own. But I would suggest to you, you know, totally plagiarizing Sir Robert Fry, that something bad is brewing. I mean, it just is. And God forbid it's to anybody here personally. But something bad is, is, is coming up over the horizon that we're not even close to thinking about it. And when it hits, you know, kind of, are you ready? You know, do we need to do some people development or some process work? I'm not sure, only you do. But if you dump your hard drive, you forget this story, you're like, I don't need to hear about, you know, any more war stuff. But if you think about that, when you do get jammed up, and unfortunately, again, it's, it's going to happen, remember the three mottos of this task force. Free the oppressed. Night stalkers don't quit. 
and rangers lead the way.